Throughout human history, standards of beauty have changed with the times. Some standards encourage people to go to extremes to meet what is expected, and sometimes what is expected will result in the person undergoing extreme pain. No practice better encapsulates the horrors inflicted than that of foot binding. Girls as young as three would have their feet and toes broken to better shape them into the desired size of three inches. In today's video, we will cover why such a practice developed, just what millions of young girls endured, and how such a practice was thankfully put to rest. The origins of foot binding can be seen in the 10th century, and a favoured court dancer named Yao Niang. It is said that she bound her feet into the shape of a new moon, and danced upon a decorative six-foot golden lotus. She is thought to have danced so gracefully and enchanted the Emperor Li Yu so much that others took up the practice to also gain favour and admiration. It became a practice both amongst the upper classes to show their status, and the lower classes eager to move further up the social class. When the Mongols started the Yuan dynasty in 1279, many Chinese traditions were adopted to help assimilate and confirm their rule, but they did not engage with foot binding. As a result of this, a woman's feet would be a clear ethnic identity, allowing the practice to become integral to Chinese identity. It soon became desirable for women and girls to have smaller feet for a multitude of reasons aside from the ethnic identifier. For one, small feet were seen as an erotic symbol. The way a woman would walk with such bound feet would mean her buttock, thigh and pelvic muscles would tighten, all of which would aid in lovemaking. Much like how incredibly thin waists were seen as desirable in Victorian England, so too were small feet in China. Small feet were seen as feminine, whereas large feet were seen as crude and unbecoming. And due to the damage inflicted, women with bound feet would struggle to walk long distances, leaving many housebound. Such women would be forced to be reliant upon their husbands and lack their own agency. It would also mean that young women would be forced into handwork, such as making fishnets or clothes, and contribute to their family as they had little to no other option. Despite how one interprets the reasons behind this practice, most point to the subjugation of women to the benefit of others. The actual practice of foot binding is truly disturbing. Young girls between the age of three and six years old would undergo the process, it was done at a time where their feet would be close to the desired size, when the bones had not yet fully developed, and when their bones would be easier to break. It would often be done by the girl's mother, or a professional foot binder. The process would be done by soaking the girl's feet in warm water, followed by massaging with oils, herbs or animal blood to soften the skin. The toenails would then be cut right back as to avoid them from growing into the skin once the toes were forced into their new position. Save for the big toe, the girl's toe would then be broken and curled under the sole of the foot. Once the four toes had been broken and forced under the foot, a long stretch of silk would be wrapped around the child's foot, keeping the broken toes in place. As the cloth was wound around the foot, it was pulled ever tighter and tighter forcing the ball of the foot and the heel to come together. This would result in the broken foot folding along the arch creating a cleft. At the end, the cloth would be sewn so that the girl could not loosen or remove the bindings. As you might imagine, such a process was incredibly painful, but this was not the end of the matter. The feet would be inspected every two or so days to check for infection. The bindings would need to be replaced, the toenails trimmed, and any rotting flesh to be washed away. The feet would be kneaded or beaten again to soften and mould them to the desired shape. Any excess flesh would be cut away or allowed to set in. Once again, the feet would be bound up in the cloth and repeat until the foot had reached the desired size. After two years of nearly daily bindings, beatings and breakings, the process would be deemed complete. For the broken bones to heal, it would take years, and even then, they might be purposefully rebroken as the girl grew older to retain the small size. Walking around would be incredibly difficult, having to walk on the unbroken big toe or heel of the foot, so falls were common. With the foot in a misshapen and unmovable position, it was prone to atrophy and paralysis. A major risk was infection, made worse by the lack of blood flow to the feet. It is thought that as many as 10% of the girls who underwent the foot binding died as a result of infection or gangrene. 
The goal was to create a foot around 4 inches long in what was termed the Golden Lotus. This would be the most desirable foot size, and one that would allow for marriages well above a family's social standing. Often the feet would be kept hidden within foot wraps and the specialised lotus shoes. Many of the men who desired such small feet unwilling to even look upon them. The practice was not adopted by every region of China, nor by every ethnic group. Some practices involve the narrowing of the feet as opposed to the full-on binding, and opposition to the practice persisted throughout its prevalence. During the Manchu rule of China in the 17th century, there were attempts to ban the practice, though such edicts did not have the public backing and were ignored. In the late 19th century, a number of people pushed for the ban of foot binding, notably the Foot Emancipation Society. As Western missionaries became more prevalent, so too did their opposition to the practice, seeing it as an affront to mutilate the body given by God. Opposition came from a number of different ideological sources, from feminists to Chinese reformers. In 1912, the practice was banned again by the Republic of China. Campaigns to stomp out the practice involved inspectors ensuring no girls were being subjected to foot binding. By the 1950s, the practice had all but died out. The decline in the practice coincided with two notable changes to Chinese society. Mao Zedong and his new communist government, who viewed women as more equal in terms of their role in the communist revolution. The practice was banned as it was seen to cripple an otherwise valuable worker. It also coincided with a rise in factory production for many of the items that the women would make at home, bound by their feet and family. Without an immediate need for such items to be made, and with a push for a society where everyone was expected to work in the same manner, the practice was doomed to fade. In addition, during Mao's rule, the practice was ridiculed with women mocked for having bound feet, with some even having their coverings forcibly removed for all to see. It was seen as a relic of the old China, no longer compatible with the modern China Mao was seeking to create. Men who previously desired women with such small feet often discarded their wives in favour of a new social order that no longer found the practice acceptable or attractive. The final factory that produced those tiny lotus shoes closed down in 1999, the last vestige of the foot binding practice. Many of those alive today who had their feet bound, it was done in secret at a time where the practice was in decline. Foot bindings is perhaps one of the most striking examples of extreme beauty standards and the harm it can cause. It is an example of how traditions can take root and become normalised despite the suffering and pain they can inflict, and a disturbing example of what families were prepared to do for a better life or social standing and wealth. But even when the practice was finally abandoned, the victims of the practice too were discarded and ridiculed. Foot binding ought to be remembered as a cruel practice that disfigured millions of young girls, all in the name of achieving a harmful beauty standard.